Shavuos was the beginning of the process. Zman matan Torah. That's the beginning. But it's up to us to receive the Torah. It's up to us to get it, to use it. Welcome to today's year. It's part of a new program where we will try to give a little bit more depth and meaning to the Yom Tov, even to the holidays that we uh, are about to celebrate. Obviously, on the subject of today, Shavuos, Matan Torah, Rus, it's very difficult in an hour to cover everything. I'll try to give you what they say in, he- in Hebrew, Tayamel, a taste, a little taste of each subject. We'll focus a little bit on the preparation for Shavuos. We'll focus a little bit on Shavuos itself. And then maybe a few thoughts on Megillus Rus. So, as we mentioned in the, uh, sh- in the Pesach Shir, there was a great tzaddik, the Risol of Ruzhin, who would comment and say that Pesach and Shavuos is really one yantif, one holiday. He would say Pesach is the first days, Sfira Sa'imer, the day, the in-between days are what we would call Chalamod, the intermediate days, and Shavuos is the final days. And it makes a lot of sense, because the Pasuk says, the whole reason that I'm taking you out of Egypt is Tavdun Yasalekim Allah Raza to serve God on the on Mount Sinai. So really, the truth is, it's all one piece. It's all one. Uh, it's all one uh, solid yantif. The Exodus of Egypt, the Sfira Sa'imer, and Shavuos is really one uh, one one con- one continuum of serving of of getting to the level of serving Hashem. So. Let's start a few for a, with a few thoughts on Sfira Sa'emer, that we're still in the middle, we still have a few days left to Shuas. <clears throat> it says, Usfartem Lachem, Mimachras Shabbos, used to start counting after, after Pesach, Sheva Shabbos, seven weeks. Really, the truth is that uh, the question is, why do we count seven days, seven weeks, excuse me? Why do we count seven weeks? The Ran at the end of Psachim says, simply, the Jewish people wanted, were, heard that there's going to be a Torah given. And they were so excited, they were so excited to, that they're going to receive the Torah, that they were counting the days, they were counting how long it would be for them to, uh, to get it. But the, really the question becomes, why do we count the days that passed? Meaning saying, for example, let's say today would be the 23rd day of the Omer, or the, or the 43rd day of the Omer. Why not say we have these amount of days left to receive the Torah? If the whole point is that we're excited to get the Torah, instead of saying what we did, let's let's, uh, anticipate and hope and and be excited about when we're going to get it. So we should say, for example, if today was, let's say, the uh, 42nd day of the Omer, let's say today is seven days left till, till the receiving of the Torah. So the very beautiful thought from uh, from the ethical masters, and the basic the basic understanding is that <clears throat> what we're trying to do, what we, we the the concept of Sfira Sa'imer, and we say it every night. We we engage the traits, the midas, the emotive trait, the chesed, the gvura, the tiferes, netzach, hoid, yisoid, etc. What we're trying to do is we're trying to build ourselves up. We're trying to refine ourselves. So the truth is, the more we refine ourselves, the more we're ready for going for uh, receiving the Torah. So it's not about how many days is left till till Shuas. What is what we're really expressing to ourselves mainly is look at what we'd have, we've accomplished so far. We've accomplished that out of the forty nine mixtures of traits that we uh, that uh, there are. Chesed should be chesed. Chesed should be gvura. Kindness intermixed with severity, etc. Beauty, all the midas, all the traits that are uh, mentioned. We are telling ourselves, look what we've accomplished. We're on our way up. We're going up. We're going higher. We 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 uh, we've we've accomplished so much, and we still have a little bit more to go. But we're focusing on what we've accomplished, what we've done. We're going up. We're not going down. 
there's a very, um, how should I say it, a strong vert, a strong thought. Uh, it has to be said correctly in order to, to appreciate it. And it's a Hasidic vert. It's not mentioned by uh, a specific tzaddik. I've seen it. <clears throat> but it's uh, brought down in many different svarim. And the question is, the, the carbon, the, uh, the, the wheat, or the, the celebration of, of the Omer was based on barley. The, the, it was, the barley was, you know, the, the carbon, the, the Minchas Omer was barley. <clears throat> barley is generally uh, considered an animal food. Was, wasn't really used for human beings unless, unfortunately, there was no other choice. On Shavuos, after the, after the Omer, after the seven weeks, there was a special carbon, a special sacrifice, or a special gift to the, to the altar called Shtei Halechem, the two breads. Uh, that was one of the two times in the entire year that chametz was brought to the Beis Hamikdash. Generally, everything in the Beis Hamikdash in the temple was was kosher for Pesach, was matzah. But there were two times that uh, um, uh, chametz was brought, and the one of them was a min, if a person brought a certain a carbon taida, a a Thanksgiving offering, but that wasn't an obligation. The obli- the the the, the ob- ob- obligatory sacrifice that had to be bread that had to be chametz was on Shavuos, so the tzaddikim the uh, ask the Hasidic masters ask why is it that on Sfiras Omer the aim the seven weeks that we're trying to better ourselves we bring a lowly barley uh, sacrifice, and on Shavuos we bring a wheat sacrifice, and the answer uh, that's given. In Yiddish, it comes out a little bit harsh, but we have to understand it in the context that it's given. It is because during the seven weeks, a person has to realize that he's still a behemoth, that he's still an animal, that he has animalistic issues that he has to purge himself of. If a person thinks that he's he he reached his apex, he reached his perfection already, so he's he's merely fooling himself. During the forty-nine days between Pesach and Shuas where we try to elevate ourselves and we try to really in, look into ourselves, not just on seven traits, but as the seven traits intermingle with seven other traits. And we're really trying to be honest with ourselves. So we have to know and understand that we have to rear ourselves of our animalistic desires. It's no secret that Alter Rebbe begins in Tanya that there, we have two souls. We have a nefesh abahami, an animal soul, and a nefesh aliki, a, a godly soul. doesn't mean the nefesh abahami, the animal soul, is bad. It means that it, 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 it expresses itself in a non-godly way. And the purpose of, of a Jew, the, the Aveda of a Jew, indeed his whole life, is to take that animal and elevate it. Take that animal and bring it up to a higher level. So in, in, in a way, that's the understanding why during the days of Sfira, the carbon, the sacrifice brought in the Beis Hamikdash was the was the Omer, which was a barley, because that was the time where we had to deal with our animal selves. On Shavuos, where we finally finished the seven times seven, the forty nine days of elevation, so now we can bring the 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 human food. Now we can bring something human. Um, it's interesting, um, and this is something that our Rebbe instilled in us that all aspects of Torah are, are connected. Um, there's a phenomenal uh, din, there's a halacha, that is specifically related to Shuas. And, and that is, we know that, um, we know that every Shabbos, or Yantif, some people say it's a mitzvah, and not some people, that, that's the halacha. But we, we're able to make the Shabbos or the Yantif earlier. Uh, we can bring Shabbos in earlier, we can bring Yantiv in earlier, we can daven earlier. <clears throat> it's called Teisvis Shabbos, Teisvis Yantiv. However, the halacha brought down in the Magan Avram, and it's brought down in mo- most commentaries, that on Shavuos, the first night of Shavuos, you cannot daven Mairev earlier. You have to, you cannot uh, bring in the Yantiv early. You have to keep the, uh, the Yantiv, you have to do it uh, in its proper time, and and uh, Davin Meirev, etc., at the at the correct time when it's when it's completely nightfall, 
And the question is why? Why is it that spe- that specifically Shvuas, Shvuas, we 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 are commanded, so to speak, or we're we're the halacha tell, dictates that we we uh, we cannot make it earlier. There's a uh, this sometimes adding to Shabbos is considered a virtue. We're adding, we're taking away from the weekday, from the chayil, and we're adding. We're 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 making it Shabbos. What could be better than that? We're making it yantiv. What could be better than adding from the weekday into the time of Matan Torah? So there's many answers. We'll get to uh, one or two of them perhaps later in the in the class in this year. But one of the beautiful answers is based on what I just said. If if uh, the Torah dictates that in order to refine ourselves and elevate our animal selves and reach the level of an Adam, reach a level of man, reach a level of our potential, which we really have, refining the seven times seven traits. If the Torah says we need 49 days, so we can't come and say, you know what, 48 and a half is enough. We need the complete 49. We need the complete Memtes. We need the Tmimus, the completion of all those things, because we have to utilize every gift that God and the Torah gives us to use to elevate our, 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 uh, our physical and materialistic selves. So therefore, specifically on Shuas, after seven weeks of working on our emotions, working on our, on our uh, materialism, working on all the things that, that, so to speak, sometimes drags us down, the Gvura should be Gvura, Yisait should be Yisait, etc., etc., we can't say to ourselves, even a half a day earlier, you know what, I'm there. I'm there already. No, it doesn't work. You need the complete gift. You need the complete 49 days. <clears throat> There's another beautiful question uh, as it relates to Sphere Saimer, and then we'll continue with, uh, with Shuas, perhaps. Uh, the Pasik says, A person has to count seven days, and you should count 50 days. Now, the way I just translated it, was very clear. However, the Torah says Hamishim, which is plural, 50. 50 is, is not 5, it's 50. So it should say Hamishim Yamim. Tisperu Hamishim Yamim. Why does it say Tisperu Hamishim Yamim? You should count 50 day. So, again, among the myriad of answers is the ethical masters tell us something very beautiful. A person could get very depressed. And he'll say to himself, you know what? Even though Rabbi Weiss just said something about using all the 49 days and elevating everything, I don't feel I'm there. I don't feel I did enough. I don't feel I reached it. I don't feel that all of my traits have been, uh, have been elevated. Says the Torah, lo nora, don't worry about it. Tisperu chamishim yoyim. Each day, each day, each, each, ele- each um, effort that you've put into to elevating yourself is critical, is important, and is welcomed by God. Tisperu chamishim yoyim. You're counting 50, but realize that every single day is precious. Every single day is, is, uh, is meaningful. So, as we're continuing in the calendar, um, there's a very wonderful Gemara, and the Gemara basically tells us what exactly happened from the beginning, the first day, Rosh Chodesh Sivan, Till Matan Torah, till the sixth of Sivan, won't go through it now. But basically, the uh, there's a pasuk in the Torah. We don't even need the Gemara to tell us. The Torah says, "Bachodesh Ashlishi" on the third day and the first day, the Jewish people came to um, uh, they came to Midbar Sinai, the desert of Sinai. So the Gemara explains, and the Medrash tells us what exactly happened on each day. And it says on the first day on Rosh Chodesh Sivan, nothing happened. Nothing happened. Moshe didn't speak to them. Moshe didn't tell them anything, because they were re- weary from the uh, from the from the trip, weary from the trip, and Moshe didn't t- teach them, uh, didn't tell them anything. You know, the the program, so to speak, began on the second day. So the Rebbe asks a wonderful question. Everything in Torah is exact. Everything in Torah is um, is meduyak. So if Moshe didn't do anything, if the Jewish people didn't learn anything that day, and Moshe didn't teach them anything that day, and it really started on the second day, so why mention it at all? In other words, we're trying, it would seem to be that the first day of Sivan 
is the first day of the process, the first day of the six days. But the Gemari then goes on to say that nothing happened. So what's going on? And in a nutshell, the Rebbe explains something very beautiful. And that's the core of, of, um, of Shavuos. And that is that a Jew has to realize, in, before he begins to accept the Torah, he has to realize that he is quote-unquote nothing. He has to abnegate himself from his own, his own intellect, his own understanding. And only then can he begin to become a keli, a vessel, for, uh, for receiving the Torah. In other words, so the Rosh Chodesh Sivan, the nothing, was, was, um, was completely um, calculated. The nothing was part of the process. The nothing was, like we say at the end of every time we say Amidah, V'nafshi ke'afar lakol tiyeh p'sach libi b'sor And the Rebbe would say hundreds of times, the, the, the condition to the accepting of Torah and mitzvahs is a person has to realize v'nafshi ka'afar lakol tiyeh. I'm nothing. Without God, I am nothing. By the way, this answers a, another answer of a fundamental question that is dealt with extensively in the commentaries. The Rebbe deals with it in hundreds of places. And the question is, what was the chidush of Matan Torah? What was the novelty of, of, uh, of what we received on Mount Sinai? Throughout Torah, we're told that the Jewish people learned Torah. Yaakov Avinu spent 14 years in the yeshiva. He was le- what was he doing? He was learning Torah. Avram Avinu, the Gemara says, had a shas. He had a, he had a set of Talmud. And his uh, mesechta, his tractate of Avodah Zarah, had 400 chapters. The Shevet Levi in, the, um, in Egypt, they, didn't, they weren't part of servitude. They weren't part of slavery. What did they do? They were learning. So there was Torah before Matan Torah. So what's going on? There was there was there was knowledge. There was there was the Shomru as Mishmarti, and there was uh, uh, there was a tradition that was given over from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to the children. And one of the answers we'll get to the to a, a fundamental answer in a few minutes. One of the answers is what I just said: the Torah before Matan Torah was a human intellectual Torah. There was understanding, there was maybe even a little mysticism in it, but it was something that they could appreciate. Um, and, and therefore, the, the distinction between the Torah before Matan Torah, before the 6th of Sivan, and after, was that itself. That the, till then, they underst- they, they, the, the Torah that was learned was a quote-unquote human Torah, a Torah that was understood by Seichel. Now they're going to get a divine Torah. Now they're going to get a Torah from God. In order to make that break between what I believe needs to happen and what God tells me to do, there, there, uh, there had to be a day of emptiness. And that was Rosh Chedr Sivan. That was Rosh Chedr Sivan. If you recall, uh, on the Pesach Shir, we mentioned part of the famous, um, part of the famous Dayenu. Everybody knows the beautiful song, Day Dayenu. So it's 15 steps, 15 levels. We thank God that had you only done this, dayenu, it's enough. So one of the crucial dayenus is had you brought us to Mount Sinai and not given us the Torah, dayenu. And the Rebbe asks, how can you say such a thing? What's the point of coming to Har Sinai and not getting the Torah? So the Rebbe answers, and it's also brought down in many commentaries, based on the Pasuk, based on the passage that we mentioned before, Bachedesh Hashlishi, on the third month, Bayichan Sham Yisrael Negedahar, the children of Israel encamped. And again, the beauty of, of Lashon HaKodesh, the Holy Tongue, is the nuances is very strong. It should have said, Vayachanu in the plural, Vayachanu Bnei Yisrael, the, ch- the Jewish children encamped in a plural. Vayichan is singular. And the answer is, as Rashi says there, Rashi, the premier uh, commentator on the Torah, Rashi, Rabban Shal Yisrael, Rashi tells us, Vayichan, why does it say Vayichan and not Vayachanu, plural? Because it was Ki Ishechad Belevechad, they were one. Says the Rebbe, if the Jewish people, uh, if, if, 
if if all that would have been accomplished before Matan Torah was that there's unity among Jews, Dayenu, that's enough. It's a wonderful thought, especially today, where unfortunately we deal with a lot of issues, and we should focus more on what unites us than on what divides us, and we'll find that there's a uh, a lot more that unites us than divides us, and that's the lesson of the Shredish Siva and the first of Siva. So while we're on the topic of Midbar Sinai, we have to ask the classic question. If I would give a Torah, I would give it in Midtown Manhattan, or London, or Jerusalem. Why did God give the Torah in a desert? Why did God give us the most important, critical moment in Jewish history and world history happened in a barren desert? And there's many answers to it. The Medrash, I believe, says because just like the Midbar is Hefker, just like a desert is ownerless, even today, even today in 2023, you can go to the Mojave Desert, you can go to the Sahara Desert, somewhere in the middle of the desert, build a house, I guarantee you nobody's going to bother you. Nobody will, nobody will tell you you have to pay taxes, nobody will tell you you have zoning restrictions. The, the Midbar is ownerless. So the same way, says the Medrash, we have to realize that nobody has ownership, so to speak, or nobody has claim that they have the Torah. Torah is earned, not given. Torah is something that we have to, to, to study, we have to learn it, and more than that, everybody can do it. It's not, it's not owned by one group or one person. It has to be authentic, it has to be the Messiah of the tradition, but we have to realize that the mid, just like the Midbar, the desert is ownerless, the same thing the Torah is ownerless. Um, there's a wonderful uh, Gemara. The Gemara says, Hizaru shmehem Be careful from children of impoverished uh, families, because from them Torah will come. Why? why? Why does Torah come from poor families? Because, unfortunately, that's the reality. A, a child of a wealthy family says to himself, you know what, I, uh, I'll get into the best yeshiva, I'll, uh, I'll marry the best girl, I'll uh, get the best position. Unfortunately, it doesn't work out like that. But the poor child, the child from a poor family, says, if I don't uh, buckle down and study, nothing will happen. If I want to be a rabbi, if I want to be somebody, I have to study, I have to uh, exert myself. Meaning, because every person, even a, a, uh, somebody who doesn't come from distinguished background, has the ability to learn Torah. The greatest of the great, the greatest rabbis in, in, in Judaism, and we'll talk about that at the end of this year, the greatest leaders and rabbis in Judaism were converts. Shemaya and Naftalian, um, Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Meir, these are all, Unkel Sager, these were people that came from quote-unquote nothing. As we'll talk at the end of the year, Rus, the mother of the grandmother of King David, the grandmother of Mashiach, was a Moabite, a Moabite woman, and it, 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 this it, this is one of the reasons that we read Rus on Shuas to show us that even somebody from a lowly background, even somebody from a questionable background, they they have the ability and they can become the greatest Torah leaders. So the reason the Torah was given in the desert is to show that. Nobody, nobody lays claim to Torah. Another reason, um, I believe, I saw it in the name of the Rebbe. Um, I've, I've said it before. It's uh, that the Torah, the purpose of Torah, is to take a desert, a spiritual desert, and make it blossom, and make it, uh, and make it into a a fertile ground. Torah is not only for the Orthodox religious communities. Torah is meant to be taught in Sherman Oaks, California. That was the beginning of desert. In Hawaii, Honolulu, Hawaii, Nome, Alaska, Tulsa, Oklahoma. You know, places that you would never think Torah will flourish. The purpose of Torah is to take the world and turn it into, from a midbar, from a, de- a spiritual desert, into a spiritual oasis. And that's the reason the Torah was given in the Midbar, to show that even in a place that's devoid of any spirituality, that is where the Torah has to be given. So, which leads us to another question. We know, uh, 
everybody knows that the Torah was given on Mount Sinai. The Torah was given on Mount Sinai, Har Sinai. So the question is, why? Why was the Torah given on Mount Sinai? <clears throat> so the Gemara says, one of the more well-known uh, pieces of Gemara, of Talmud, that Sinai, Mount Sinai was the lowest mountain in the area. There were other mountains, but this was the lowest mountain to teach us that a person has to approach Torah and his relationship with God, as we said before, with humility. With humility, with anava, with uh, not uh, haughtiness and not uh, holding himself on a high horse. He has to be, he has to be, uh, has to be, uh, uh, you have to, it has to be from the lower mountains. So the Rebbe and other commentaries ask the obvious question. Why give the Torah then on a mountain? Give the Torah in a valley. If you want to emphasize lowliness, if you want to emphasize that you should be, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be so haughty, why give it on a mountain? Give it on a flat land, give it on a valley. And the answer is so beautiful that, yes, we have to know that we shouldn't be haughty, we shouldn't have vanity, we shouldn't have excess uh, feeling of self. But on the other hand, we can't be a shmata. On the other hand, there has to be a certain gaiva digdusha, like they say, a holy, uh, holy, holy feeling of, of self. A person has to realize that he is not a, uh, a nothing. He's a something. <clears throat> they say a story, a, ch- a beautiful Hasidic story, of a chassid. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it was a chassid of the first Rebbe of Chabad, the Alter Rebbe, and he was a very wealthy man, and he carried himself with a very healthy attitude of self. Yeah, whenever he walked into a room, he immediately went to the, uh, to the front of the room in what they call in Hebrew the Mizrachvant, the, the, the eastern wall where the important people sat. And whenever there was a, a meeting or a fabrengen or a, 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 a gathering, he demanded to speak, and he spoke in a very authoritative and a very, very... Uh, in, in, a, in a manner that, that showed that he really held of himself. And he, there was what to, to hold of. He was a scholar, he was a wealthy man, he was a chassid. But they felt that he was being a little bit too haughty, a little bit too balgaiva, like they say. And they one time challenged him at a chassidic fabreng, and they said, Remotl, why are you such a balgaiva? Why are you such a show-off? You know, you go into a place, you know, you have to go right away to the Eastern Wall, and if you sit in the second row, it's not good, and if you don't speak first, it's not good enough for you? He says, you don't understand. You don't understand, said Ramatul. He said like this, he said, I'm a businessman, and I travel, and I go all over the place, and, uh, you know, a business person has temptations on the, on the road. There are things that, uh, that, that are not easy, what to eat and what to do, who to connect with, where to sit, where to, where, what, in what type of environment to be in. And I have a very healthy uh, Yetzer, I have a very healthy uh, inclination. So I turn to my Yetzer Hara, I turn to my evil inclination, and I say, you're coming to me? You're trying to tell me, to, te- to tempt me to do something wrong? You know who I am? I'm Reb Matl. I'm the Chassid of the Alter Rebbe. I'm a scholar. I'm a wealthy person. You're not going to get me. He used his, his vanity, so to speak. He used his, his healthy gaiva for something in holiness. In other, words, in other words, what he did was he used a trait that was maybe one of the worst traits, because the Gemara says in Saita that God tells the Balgaiva, I can't be with you, I can't be with you, because you're too haughty. You, there's no room for me and you together in one place. But if a Jew uses his... his uh, his, his healthy attitude of self for holiness, that's a wonderful thing. So this is, the, this is the intimation why the Torah was given on Har Sinai, because to teach us that, yes, it has to be Sinai, it has to be Machach and Kol it has to be a low mountain, but it has to be a mountain. You can't be a Shmata, you have to have a healthy feeling of self, you have to have a healthy feeling of, of uh, who you are. In connection to that, I'd like to add something. There's a very um, intricate and complicated Gemara in the Sugya, in the topic of, of Matan Torah, of exactly what day the Torah was given. It's too difficult for me to get into now. Uh, but one of the comments over there is 
that the Gemara gets to is that really the Torah was supposed to be given on a certain day, and Moshe Rabbeinu added another day. Hosef midaitoi. Moshe Rabbeinu delayed the giving of the Torah one more day. And the commentaries are shocked. God wants to give the Torah on this day, and you're delaying it? What's going on? And one of the beautiful answers is based on what I just said at length. Moshe Rabbeinu saw that the Jewish people were getting a little bit too full of themselves. So he felt that they need a little bit more shiftless, a little bit more humility, a little bit more down. So he delayed it. And the delay caused that the Jewish people said, what's going on? Why isn't, maybe we're not worthy enough. And this caused them a, a, uh, a feeling of less of self. And then Moshe Rabbeinu said, now, we are, now you're ready to get the Torah. <clears throat> There's another whole wonderful topic uh, about Matan Torah that I'll address in a very, uh, very, very uh, quickly, so to speak. The Gemara says something incredible. The Gemara says, we all know, one of the most famous sayings, that the Jewish people, as they were uh, approached by God, if they want the Torah, this is a famous medrash, every child knows it, we learn in Cheder, that God went to the nations of the world to offer them the Torah, and they all said no for various reasons, and God came to the, to the Jewish people, and he said, would you like the Torah? So instead of asking what's in it, like the other nation says, they said, Nasa v'nishma. We will do, and then we will learn. Meaning, we're willing to accept your Torah unconditionally. We're willing to take it. So the Gemara says that by, the, based on the Pasuk, on the passage regarding Matan Torah, where it says that the Jewish people were waiting at the, what we would call the foot of Mount Sinai. So the wording of the Torah is Vayis Yatzvu B'Tach Sahar. They were standing at the bottom of the mountain, which, like I said before, really means the foot of the mountain. The Gemara says that, no, that's not what it means. There's a more metaphorical uh, explanation. That God uprooted Mount Sinai, uprooted it, placed it on top of the Jewish nation, meaning the mountain was very wide, even though it was a small mountain, and but it, it covered the entire two million or three million Jewish people that were there, and God boomed out and said, if you accept the Torah, good, if not, shom tehek furaskum, that's where it's going to, that's where your burial place will be. And the wording that is used in the Gemara is, kofa aleim har kigigis, God uh, forced the mountain on them like a cover of a pot. So the the Tais, Taisus right over there, which is the, one of the premier commentaries on the Gemara, asks the obvious question. God, what are you doing? The Jewish people just told you, Nasev and Nishma, we'll, we'll ta- we're taking it. We're taking it. So why, why, uh, why did you have to do that? Why did you have to, so to speak, force them? So one of the beautiful answers is, because, you know, people are on a high. They, uh, they get excited. And they, uh, they, they say, they're, they're very into, uh, they'll do whatever they, at that, at that moment you can get them to do anything. But later on, as their ardor cools, they, uh, they say to themselves, well, we didn't really mean everything. We didn't really mean that we're going to do everything all the time. So in order to dispel any such thing, God says, you know what? Very nice. Nasev and Nishma. But in addition to that, I'm going to hold you to it. I'm going to force you to do it, so to speak. And, and, uh, and later on, you can't come and, uh, and claim that you, you, you don't want to do it anymore. And as an aside, the, uh, <clears throat> the Gemara says over there, when, when did they really accept it? When was it really, so to speak, when do we know that the Jewish people accepted the Torah? In the time of Achashverosh. Hadar Kiblu, the Gemara says, the Torah says, Kimu v'kiblu Yehudim, in the Megillah, the famous Pasuk, the Jewish people accepted it. So the Gemara says, that's when we knew. So the Hasidic commentaries say something very beautiful. Mount Sinai, Har Sinai, was the greatest divine revelation in history. God Himself revealed Himself to the Jewish nation and said to, word, to Psukim, I am God and I, you shouldn't have any other gods. There was no greater time in the history of a revelation of Elikus, of godliness. Esther was the greatest hidden time of, in Jewish history. It was a time of Hester Panim. There was a, there was a serious question that, or a serious 
uh, a, um, uh, uh, th- a thought that Haman HaRasha would be able to annihilate the entire Jewish nation, the entire everybody. It was no, never such a situation. It was so when the Jewish people in the time of Esther, in the time of Hester, in the time of hiddenness, that they reaccepted the Torah. That's when God knew that it's real. In the time of a divine, when everything is great, by the you know the wedding, you know everything is great, you know everybody's happy. You'll do you'll do anything, but when it's uh, when it's the it, it's when the times get tough and difficult. That's when it really that's when it really uh, uh, matters. There's a famous pasuk in Hosea, Hosea, that we many people say it as they wrap their tefillin around their finger. They say they rastich lilaylam. That God says, I have, I have made you into my bride forever. And we know that in Jewish law, the, uh, the, uh, there's two steps to marriage. One is what we call arusa, which is engagement, and one is called nesu, which is married. So the question becomes, why does God say, I, uh, I will become engaged to you forever? Engagement is a relatively temporary time period. Why not say, I will be married to you forever? So I saw a beautiful uh, thought. During the time of engagement, a bride and groom are very careful to to do everything that they that that mean is meaningful and nice, and they're very careful with each other, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's a very sensitive time. It's a time when they're on their best behavior. God says, "That's what I want from you. I want you to be not used to me, so to speak, as a a, a, a married couple after forty years of marriage." Just you know, just takes everybody for granted. I don't want you to take me for granted. I want you to be like a bride and groom in their engagement when they're so excited that when am I going to see my my bride and next time? When am I going to see my groom? When will I spend the time with them? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. That's the attitude I want you to have. I saw another beautiful verse that I want to share with you. Why did God take the mountain and and cover the cover it and threaten the Jews? Or let's use a better word force the Jews to accept it. The Jews said, Nasev and Ishma. So again, this is where the play I said before, sometimes halacha comes into drush. Halacha comes into to, uh, to uh, you know, ethics. There's a halacha that says, a pasuk in the Torah that says that if somebody rapes or somebody forces himself on another woman, one of the, uh, one of the punishments, so to speak, or one of the consequences, better said, that uh, happens is he has to marry her forever. He can never send her away. In the olden days, you know, women's rights, except by the Jewish people, were very, very uh, negligible. So if a, if a man forced himself on a woman, he, he, th- there was a very serious consequence that he had to have her, he had to marry her for the rest of his life and support her. He can never send her away. So this was one of the inner reasons that God, so to speak, forced himself on the Jewish people, he, 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 he was unus them, he, he forced himself, he, he was the groom and the Jewish people were the bride, because of that, we can never get rid of the Jewish people. So now I'd like to uh, spend some time on the holiday of Shuas and um, the importance of it and the significance of Matan Torah. I'd like to share with you something very, very, uh, what I think is nice, uh, the Rebbe has spent, uh, the Rebbe in his talks spends a lot of time on the uniqueness of Matan Torah. So I'm going to do something a little bit uh, special, uh, if I may say so myself. I'm going to ask a series of questions, a series of maybe random questions, but all good questions that the Rebbe himself asks in many different talks. And I'm going to answer them with one foundation, with one fundamental understanding. And they're going to be they're, they're going to sound random, but at the end you'll understand and you'll see how they're really all one thing. So we know the famous uh, medrash that uh, <clears throat> the Jewish people uh, the night before Matan Torah went to sleep. They went to sleep. God came in the morning, <laughs> waiting to give the Torah, and they were all sleeping. So they had to wake them up. So the med and uh, I think the medrash even says. There, the bees were buzzing, and their sleep was very sweet. It was a, they were a deep, deep slumber, and as a result of that, we in to rectify this uh, this uh, misstep that we made, we stay up the night of Shuas. 
we stay up the whole night because we don't want to, uh, we don't want, to, we, we want to correct what our forefathers did that they went to sleep. So the Rebbe asks a very uh, balabatish question, a very simple question. We began our class by saying that what the Ran says at the end of Pesachim, that the reason we count seven weeks is because the Jewish people heard they're going to get the Torah and they were so excited. We're getting the Torah in seven weeks. Does it make any sense the night before, uh, the night before we, we're getting this Torah, this gift, that we go to sleep? I remember the first time that uh, I went away to sleepaway camp in New York. I was so excited I couldn't sleep. I couldn't sleep. The night before my bar mitzvah, I couldn't sleep. It's normal. A person is excited about a, a momentous event. He doesn't sleep calmly. He doesn't slumber. So how is it that the Jewish people the night before Matan Torah went to sleep? There's another medrash, a Gemara, a very strange Gemara, very strange Gemara. The Gemara says that Moshe Rabbeinu went up to heaven, 40 days and 40 nights. So the angels were uh, all uh, aghast. Why is there a human being in heaven? Ma li'ilud isha beinenu. Why is there somebody who was born from, a, from, from human parents? So God said, you know, he's here to get the Torah. So the Gemara says that the angels came to God with a, uh, a court case. And they said, wait a minute, no, 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 no. We want the Torah. We want, the Torah is ours. We deserve the Torah. So, uh, why are you giving it away to the human beings? Why are you giving it away to people? And not only that, they, they, they haven't demonstrated themselves to be such big tzaddikim. You know, so why are you giving them the Torah? So God turns to Moshe Rabbeinu and says, answer them, answer, you know. You want the Torah, you're a representative of the Jewish people, give them a good answer. So Moshe Rabbeinu says, uh, what does it say in the Torah? Honor your parents? Do you have parents? You don't have parents. What does it say in the Torah? You shouldn't uh, do certain sins? Do you have evil inclinations that cause you to sin? What does it say in the Torah that you shouldn't steal? Do you have anything? Do you need anything? Torah is not for you, Torah is for us. So the... There's a commentary, a very interesting commentary, that asks a Talmudic question based on this Agadaic material. They say, what, was the, what were the angels thinking? What were the angels thinking? What, are they, what was their, so to speak, legal um, claim to Torah? So there's a very interesting law in, in the Gemara Bava Basra and brought down the Cheshem Mishpat. It's a valid law even till today, that if somebody has a property, a field, uh, some people say even uh, not just a field, but a house, uh, uh, income property, and he wants to sell it. And next door, right next door to me, right next door to the seller is another person, and um, he would be interested, so to speak, in buying, that, in buying that piece of land or that property. And he's willing to pay the price. He's willing to pay the same price. If, obviously, if he's not willing to pay the same price, the question doesn't begin. Here, he's willing to pay the same price. So the Gemara, the Torah says, the halacha is that if a person wants to sell an adjoining property to somebody else, to uh, to another person's property, he must offer it first to the neighbor. He must go to his neighbor and say, "Listen, neighbor, uh, my field, which is literally adjoining your field." I'm willing to sell it for $100 an acre. If you want to buy it, it's yours. Otherwise, I have somebody else to sell it. To the point where there's a question, if he sells it to somebody else, if, he's, if, the, if the owner of the, of the field sells it to somebody else, the, the adjoining neighbor can come to the court and say, it's mine. I, ha- I have a right to it. This in Hebrew or in Aramaic is called Dina de Bar Metzra. It's a, the law of the adjoining property, of the... Of the um, uh, the limit, the, the uh, boundary, the, 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 the law of the boundary. So the, the angels told God, that we're coming to you with this legal claim. You cannot give it to Meshur, to the Jewish people who are somewhere down there, down in, 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 in the desert of Sinai. The Torah, meanwhile, is here by us. So we want the Torah, and we're adjoining, so to speak. We're right next to you. We're right next to you. So the Torah really belongs to us, really belongs to us. So the... the uh, the, uh, the Rebbe asks, if that's the case, Moshe Rabbeinu's answer was no answer because all these other things about parents and stealing and evil inclination means nothing because the Torah was in fact in heaven. The Torah was, God, gave it, the, God kept the Torah next to him. It was next to his, his holy chair. So they, uh, legally, so to speak, if we want to get technical, the, the angels had a claim. So what's the answer? 
There's another question. There's an interesting discussion in the Talmud. Talmud is full of interesting discussions. The, Gemara, the, the Talmud talks about <clears throat> whether on uh, what is the obligation of a Jewish person on a holiday to uh, eat, to have bodily pleasures, meaning primarily food. We, you know, the uh, perhaps perhaps a holiday, a yomtif, should be used for spiritual pursuits. In other words, in other words, X amount of days of the year we're working. Comes a day where we're not supposed to work anymore. We're not supposed to work. So that day we should spend in the Beis Hamikdash. Yeah, eat a little bit, just you know, because we're not allowed to fast. But the so to speak, the joy of eating meat and wine, perhaps, should not be part of the Yanta celebration. And there's a major discussion about it based on the word lachem. Should be lachem to you. So the the uh, the rabbis of the Talmud come to the conclusion, based on various understanding of uh, scripture, that on every holiday, it's chetzi lachem the chetzi lachem. You divide it half to God and half to you, meaning half the day we spend in shul and yeshiva and beis medrash, shiurim, spiritual pursuits, not just wasting our time, which is, by the way, something that we should take to heart. And half the day we must uh, partake in a meal, in a, in a yontav meal, uh, especially with uh, meat and wine, and those are things that are specifically required on yontav. Simcha, joy, says the Gemara, is only with eating a good piece of meat and a good cup of wine. And then the Gemara says something very strange. This is all regarding other holidays, Sukkot and Pesach, and perhaps, according to some people in Rosh Hashanah, this is all regarding other Yom and Tovim, other holidays. But when it comes to Shavuos, when it comes to Atzeres, Kuli Alma Maida, everybody agrees that you need Lachem, that you need to have a meal. In other words, this whole pri- prior discussion about whether we should eat or shouldn't eat, whether we should spend the whole day in Shul, not spend the whole day in Shul, in Yeshiva, this is only regarding Pesach and Sukkot and the other holidays. But when it comes to Shavuos, every rabbi would agree, this is not the discussion, you must have a good meal. You must have a Geshmake, Simcha Dike meal. So the Rebbe says, what are you talking about? If, 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 if any day there would be a question of what to do that day, in other words, whether I should sit and learn all day or, or also have a sumptuous banquet, the first day that I would think that, doesn't requ- that, that shouldn't require a banquet feast would be Shavuos. Shavuos was the day we got the Torah. So we should celebrate Shavuos. Remember, um, the uh, original Shavuos is only one day. So we should celebrate the Torah by studying all day and all night. Maybe take a little break, just not to, you know, just to keep your body and soul together. Make make a quick kiddush, make a quick, uh, you know, pick a quick piece of gefilte fish and uh, have a piece of chicken and something like that. But you're saying to me that the shuas has to have a meal? It doesn't make any sense. It makes no sense. Just the opposite. Pesach, that maybe we were re- our bodies were rescued from Egypt. And Sukkot is where our bodies were protected from the elements. We should celebrate with having a good meal. Celebrate the material benefits. Shavuos was a spiritual holiday. Why do we say that that day is the, is the day that everybody, every rabbi agrees that we have to have a meal? I'll ask one more, one more question, and then we'll get to an answer. <clears throat> there was a, a very great rabbi. His name was Rav Yosef. And you know they called him? They called him Sinai. Sinai. This Rabbi Yosef was one of the greatest rabbis of the Talmud. He was a teacher of Abaya. He was known as Sinai because he knew everything. Just like God gave the Torah on Sinai everything, he, gave every, he, he knew everything. So Rabbi Yosef, on, uh, on, uh, when it came to uh, Shavuos, he told his attendant, he was blind, uh, he, he told his attendant, I want you to make me a very special, I want you to prepare me a, uh, uh, a third-born calf. I want you to prepare me a special meal because, in honor of Shavuos, because if it wasn't for Shavuos, Kama Yosef Ika Bishuka. There would be a lot of Joes in the marketplace. Shavuos was different. So the question becomes, you know, what's going on over here? You know, Rabbi Yosef was a great rabbi. He knew everything. Uh, what, 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 is, what, is, what was behind such a strange statement that if it wasn't for Shavuos, if it wasn't for the giving of the Torah, I'd just be another Joe in the market? 
To answer this question, I'll ask one more question. To answer the question, I'll ask one more question. There's a Pasuk in the Torah that says that when God gave the Torah, it was kol gadol v'lo yosef. It was a great voice, and it didn't go further. What does that mean? What does that mean? So one of the interpretations, and Rashi brings it down, was that there wasn't an echo. There was no echo. So the Rebbe asked, this is very strange. You, you want to describe the greatness of the giving of the Torah, and you tell me that there wasn't an echo? Is, is that it? That, that, that's the big deal? That there was no echo? You're, you're telling me what was the greatness of Matan Torah, and you're answering me there was no echo. What does that mean? Listen to this magnificent explanation of the Rebbe. What's an echo? An echo is you're in a place, let's say, surrounded, you go to Grand Canyon, I don't know, you're, you're surrounded by mountains, and you say, ha, ah, and the, your voice goes till the mountain and comes back, right? Come, that's an echo. It's a, in Yiddish, it's called a vidiko, a vidir, you know, in other words, it's, it's a bouncing. It bounces off the, uh, it reaches something, it reaches a mountain, or a, or a piece of ground, or a rock, and it bounces back. The whole point of Matan Torah, and this is probably one of the most important points of this entire class, the difference between everything that happened till the uh, six of Sivan, all the Torah that the fathers learned, and the Shvatim learned, and Shevet Levi learned, and even the Jewish people before Matan Torah, all that Torah was what we call physical Torah, meaning it was Torah that that it was intel- it was intellectually human etc it was it was it wasn't it was spiritual it wasn't it wasn't something that imbued the physical uh, there was no such thing as taking the skin of a cow or the skin of a leather of a calf and making like we do tefillin and imbuing that with holiness that if if, if it falls down to the ground chaz v'sholem, you kiss it or you fast there was no such thing as taking a uh, a piece of meat and making a blessing on it there was and making it into a sacrifice everything was spiritual everything was was still very metaphysical when it, the the uh, the chidush so to speak the impact or the novelty of the six of seven was something amazing that god came down the spirituality came down, came, came down, it says, Vayered Hashem al God came down to Mount Sinai. He came down, and what that really means is, now, He took His spirituality, His Torah, and when you take the, the wool of a sheep, and you turn it into tzitzes, those tzitzes becomes a chafsa digdusha, an object of holiness. It becomes holy. It becomes something that we make a blessing on. It becomes something meaningful. The physical itself became spiritual. That never happened before. The Zohar tells us that Yaakov Avinu, if you remember the story, he took a stick and he made little grooves in it and that's how he made uh, sheep with, with, with uh, spots. So the Zohar says that was the way, that was his spiritual way of putting on tefillin. You know, take a, your arm and you, you have black and white, black and white, black and white. That's tefillin, right? So Yaakov Avinu took a stick and made, you know, but the stick was, was a stick. It was nothing holy about the stick. The, 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 uh, everything that the, the forefathers did was totally spiritual, except for one mitzvah, which, will, which is for another discussion. Mitzvah of a bris. When God came down on the mountain, on Mount Sinai, on Shavuos, what he did was, he turned, he, he made a tremendous novelty. He, made, he turned the whole world physical into something spiritual. Now we can, and now we're going to answer everything. Why was there no echo? Because an echo is when something gets stopped, it's an obstacle. God's word went through everything. It went totally down into everything. Why did the Jews go to sleep? Because they felt that they knew instinctively that now we're getting a physical Torah. We're getting something that's going to affect our physical, so we have to be rested. Why do we have to? Eat? Why does everybody agree we have to eat on uh, on Shavuos? Because Shavuos is a holiday where we don't celebrate the spiritual. Shavuos is a holiday where we bring the spiritual into the physical. Why was Rabbi Yosef saying that? How many Yosefs are there in the marketplace? Because that's exactly the novelty of Matan Torah that turned the marketplace into into a, a an oasis. Why is it that? Um, um, why, um, why, 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 why was the angel's legal claim to the Torah not valid? Because it wasn't there uh, on their boundary. 
Torah was meant to be in the world. Torah was meant to affect the physical. That's why when the angel says it's ours, it's our, it's next to our property, God said, no, it's not next to your property. You, the, the, the Torah is meant to be down in this world. Let's spend a few minutes talking about Rus. <clears throat> why do we read Rus on Shuas? So there's many answers. One answer is because the process, everything, they, they left, the Rus and her mother-in-law left on Pesach, and they arrived, and the whole story evolved on Shavuos by the cutting of the of the wheat. That's one reason. Another reason is because the the ending of Rus talks about David Amelech, who was the great grandchild of Rus, and David Amelech was born on Shavuos. Another reason is because uh, I saw a beautiful reason: the gematria, the numerical value of Rus, the, the take Rus's uh, name, Reish Vav Tov, numerical value was 606. Rus, by the, by the fact that she was a non-Jew before she became a convert, was already obligated in seven mitzvahs. So she added, how many mitzvahs did she add? 606. 606 plus 7 is 613 Rus. Um, I'd like to suggest another reason and that is because, and perhaps I saw it in the Sefer, I just, at the moment I forget where if I did see it, but the whole point of Rus, the whole, like they say in Yeshiva, the Chiddush of Rus was that now the Halacha emerged from the rabbis, that um, a Moabite woman can marry into the Jewish nation. It was known, but it was forgotten. And this was something that the rabbis um, uh, came up with, or the rabbis instituted. So Rus really, the, the story of Rus, or the essence of Rus, that she was able to marry into the Jewish nation, was a result of the power of rabbinic law, a power of Torah Shabal Peh. And that's why we read Rus on Shavuos, because not we, we, have to make the, uh, we have to make it clear that not only, not only did, we, did we receive the written law, so to speak, but we primarily receive the oral law, and the oral law, the Torah Shabbat Peh, with the power of the Rabbanim, the power of the Rabbis, without that, it's not Torah. And this is emphasized in Rus. The whole essence of Rus was Moavi uh, Velo Moaviyah, and that was a, 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 an oral law. Um, I'll also add another little tidbit. Uh, Rus is known as Rus HaMoaviyah. So if you take Rus and Ha, it becomes Torah. Okay, just a little thought. So, to conclude um, with Rus, there's so much to say about Rus, but the main overriding question is why? Why is it that David HaMelech and Mashiach and the, the most important dynasty and the most important tzaddikim of, of, of Jewish history came from such an obscure and such a questionable relationship to the point that there had to be a uh, a Bezdin that said that David HaMelech is, is part of uh, Kval Yisrael, that Rus is able to marry. What's going on over here? Who was who was David's great-great-grandfather? Yehuda and Tamar. If you look in the Torah, the, 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 the relationship and the, 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 the children of Yehuda and Tamar came from also the same thing, a very questionable and a very confusing relationship. And the answer, in short, Hasidus talks about this a, long, a lot, is that true light has to come from darkness. True light comes from an obscurity. And this is the importance of what we do now, are the mitz- all the mitzvahs, etc. in Gullus. That even though we're in darkness, even though we're in, in a situation where spirituality is not apparent, and we could say to ourselves, you know what, it's not for us to do because we're not living in a, in a perfect society. We're living in, like Rus lived in Moab, etc., etc., Yisrin Ha'ar Min HaChayshach Mashiach, which is the whole purpose of Rus to, get, to, to beget David, who beget Mashiach, um, Mashiach ben David, the whole point is to prove and to bring out the light in the darkness of the world. And this is, this is the whole point of Torah. This is Matan Torah. Matan Torah was not, was not a spiritual uh, um, scripture. Matan Torah was meant to elevate the world to bring the world closer to godliness. I'd like to conclude with um, a question and an explanation. We know that the way we describe the holidays is the way we daven, 
in davening, in Musa primarily, we we say we describe each holiday. Lekenu, lekev yisenu, etc., etc. Yalev yom v'yom. So, for example, Pesach is v'man chelusenu, the day that we were freed. When it comes to Shavuos, what do we say? How do we describe the holidays? There's many descriptions in Torah of uh, of Shavuos. One is called Chag uh, Bikurim, one is called Atzeres. By the way, there's a famous vert of Reb Levitzlik of Baditchev, the Holy Baditchever, that the reason it's called Atzeres is because there's no special mitzvah. All the, the only thing we do is we we shouldn't work. And I I'll say I'll add to that that it's not it's not there's no special mitzvah Atzeres. Shavuos is everything. It's the whole thing. It's the whole package. So how do we say it in, in davening? How do we describe Shavuos? We say Zman Matan Torah Seinu. It's the day where we got the gift of Torah. So the question is, why do we call it Matan Torah? We should call it Kabbalah Satorah. We should call it the giving, the receiving of the Torah. It, it's you know, the the when a child gets a uh, beautiful a new bike <laughs> as a birthday present. He doesn't focus on the fact that my father or my mother gave me a bike. He focuses on the fact, I got a bike. The happiness is I got the bike. So why are we focusing on what God gave us and not? And the answer is because, the in fact, Shavuos was the beginning of the process. Shavuos, what we're saying is, Zman Matan Torah. That's the beginning. But it's up to us to receive the Torah. It's up to us to get it, to use it, to fulfill it, to keep it, to take it. And that's why, in Chabad terminology, the bracha, the blessing that the Rabbeim, our, our, our rabbis, would give was Kabbalah Satayra B'Simcha B'Pnimius. That the, the true bracha, the true blessing that I'm, that I'm going to give you for Shavuos is after we, Zman Matan Torah, say no, after we got the Torah, it's up to us to receive the Torah B'Simcha, with happiness, with joy, not as something as a as a as a difficulty, as something that as a burden. Bisimcha ubipnimius. We have to internalize it. It has to become part of us. So I'd like to wish you all a, a, a good yantif, and it should be take kabbalah satayra. We should receive the Torah, and we should receive the Torah joyfully, and it should be internally, and it should be part of us. Good yantif.